Okay, we're recording. And I'll just edit this little piece here. Mr. Chavana, Good afternoon. Welcome to our college. Thank you, Professor. And we're here to speak about the land rights uh, struggle, so to speak, that your family uh, has had in the past, if I'm correct. That's correct. Um, let me begin by asking uh, for you to give us a historical perspective on how the Bailey family comes to, to Texas. All right. Before that, let me just very quickly uh, talk about the conflict between Anglo-Saxon law and Latin law. England is a very small country, uh, but there was a lot of kings that wanted a lot of money to build these huge castles, and the only way they could build these huge castles and have these armies was through taxes. So they had passed a law way back then, in the 1200s, saying uh, it's called adverse possession. And basically that says that if you live on a piece of land for then five years, 10 years, and 25 years, after the end of 25 years, it's your piece of land. But it goes without saying that during this time, you're gonna be paying taxes. And that's exactly what the king wanted, that they didn't want a piece of land just there, they wanted you to produce, to have cattle, or to have crops so they could tax you. So they weren't doing it to be nice, they wanted the taxes. This was an unknown thing, adverse possession in, in, in Spain and much less even Mexico. So um, when my ancestor, uh, Pierre Bailly, uh, I am Bailly but on my mother's side, uh, came to Mexico City, this was in 1567, this was even way before the colonists came to the northeastern part of, uh, of the United States. Uh, there was no settlements over there. But over here in Mexico City, it was a thriving metropolis. The very first university to exist on the Americas was in Mexico City and still is today. Universidad Autónoma de Mexico. And it still is today, the very first university. Or UNA. UNA, yes sir. And. Uh, and so they were uh, an educated group of people. Maybe they were too educated because none of them wanted to come to this place called Texas, Texas, because there was nothing here, just mesquite trees and rattlesnakes and lizards. And they wanted to live in the metropolis. They wanted to live where there were schools, where there was culture, where there was plays. Uh, but um, there had to be some population over here so that, the, so that the Mexican government could also colonize this place called Texas and California, Arizona, New Mexico. So they did this by enticing people through land grants. Well, if you go and you settle, we will give you this huge piece of, of land. There was nobody there anyway. So you can live there and you can produce on it and you can have cattle. So, uh, through the time from, uh, from Bailly, that first Bailly that came in 1567, by the way, he was a printer, and one of his sons was a lawyer, like me, and uh, he, uh, back then, the, the, the language of the educated was Latin, and he made books, this Pedro Bailly, one of those books is uh, the discourses or speeches of, of uh, his son, yes, uh, that were written in, in Latin. If you go today to Mexico City, you go to a bookstore called the Borrua Bookstore, it's near the Zócalo, you will see the book that was uh, prepared by my ancestor back in the 1570s. Uh, still there today in, in glass, you can see it. Uh, I went and I saw it because my mother made me go. So, um, uh, in the 1700s, the uh, king wanted people to come out here, king of Spain, Carlos, wanted people to come out here and settle this land. And he would do this by telling them, you go out there, we're gonna give you this chunk of land. So yeah, okay, we'll go out there. And um, my ancestors, the Baez, settled in what is now South Texas, northern Mexico, Reynosa, this, this area, which is today called the Rio Grande Valley. And we settled out there. And several of the uh, ancestors had land grants. Um, one in particular was La Barreta, and this was 
a little bit north of, of Rio Grande, uh, composing of almost 300,000 acres. It was just a huge amount of land. So this was when Spain owned this part of the world. Exactly. And uh, it was given by um, land grant, it was called a compulso, what we would call today a warranty deed uh, to, to, to my ancestors, and they settled. But they, too, were not very careful about staying on the land. They, yeah, they wanted it, but they wanted to live in Reynosa. They wanted to live in Monterrey or Mexico City, where all the nightlife was, where all the culture was. They didn't want to be out there where there's nothing. And that was part of their downfall. So um, it, it, over time, when the part of the world became the United States, uh, or Texas first, te Texas was first a republic before it was a state. Um, the, uh, there was what we call, and my family calls, the Anglo con conversion into this part of, of the world. And um, they made offers to buy our ancestors' land, uh, and they were very, very clear. Um, either your signature is going to be on this deed, or your brains will be on there. It's up to you. Needless to say, uh, a lot of land was lost that way to, through trickery, through thuggery, through downright uh, stealing of the land, and um, that's exactly what happened. But, uh, and there's another book you can read, and I urge you to read, it's called Stolen Heritage. This is lands not too far from here, it's Victoria, Texas. I forget the name of the, of the uh, author of that book, but his family is involved also. Anyway. So how, much, how many square miles are we talking about? It's a huge amount of, that you, of land. That your family owned. It was 300,000 acres approximately, um, almost the size of what is called today the King Ranch. In fact, the King Ranch, the so-called Great Ranch of, of, of Texas, uh, took some of that land to this very day, uh, so-called Captain King. Uh, and his um, henchmen uh, also stole some of that land, but uh, it was a considerable amount of money. Uh, after, after, and, uh, and my grandfather and my great grandfathers tried to get this land back, but by then they would impose that theory, what I said a little while ago, adverse possession, well, no, you should have come back, you should have kicked these people out, well, they couldn't, they wouldn't. Uh, the, the local sheriffs, they would not uh, help my grandfather, my great-grandfather in their quest. And, and uh, the, uh, the land was lost through, through this so-called either trickery or adverse possession. So this law is still in force today? To this very day. Adverse possession. To this very day. So word to the wise, if you've got property, you've got to keep up with it. If you see some what they call squatters, kick them the hell out right away. Otherwise, uh, you're, you're facing losing, losing your land through the notion of adverse possession. It's still on the books. It's still uh, on there. Of course, it's not used so much today because, uh, you know, the times and everything uh, that uh, people tend to to keep up with their land more so than back then. So in terms of constitutional right violations, which are the ones that come into question? Well, obviously, when uh, there was the war between Mexico and the United States, they settled it through the, notion, through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The idea between the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was that the rights of the persons who lived here and who had land would be respected. That was the theory. However, uh, they made claims later on, the, the ancestors through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, hey, you're not respecting the treaty that there was between Mexico and the United States. Uh, and then um, excuses were made. Well, Congress did not uh, adopt this uh, law. It was just a presidential uh, agreement between the two presidents, and therefore, since con Congress did not ratify it, we don't have to uh, adhere to it. And that was that. Uh, more recently, um, I was involved with another family member um, who was an attorney in Austin, 
uh, in getting the family together, and there's quite a few of us uh, throughout the Southwest and um, actually the whole United States. And we uh, were discussing about filing a lawsuit, and our claim was that no, our ancestors did not sell the land to these people, to the King, to King Ranch, and to the Armstrong. Uh, it was merely a lease. And that was going to be our theory of uh, recuperating our land. So this, uh, this lease that your family Members. alleged was, uh, was in, in effect, where is that document? It, we had copies of the document. We also had, my mother in her possession, had the original land grant from the king to a family, uh, uh, Captain Bailly, uh, and uh, all this was uh, obtained. Other documents family members had, and uh, we were in the midst of preparing a lawsuit when, bam, the Armstrong family and the King Ranch family hit us uh, with, with something called a declaratory judgment. And a declaratory judgment is something uh, w that means just what it says. They wanted the judge to declare any rights that we may have null and void, either under the theory of there is no lease, and if there is a lease, adverse possession applies and they're too, uh, too late in making their claim. And so we went around and around on this, um, on this uh, claim, uh, and it was in the courts for about three and a half years when after that time and all our uh, efforts and, and, and depositions <coughs> and all of this had been presented to the court, um, they filed for what we call summary judgment. Summary judgment is just a fancy word of saying, judge, we want you to go ahead and decide the case with what's been admitted into evidence, with what's on the record. There is no need for a trial, which I believe in and of itself should be unconstitutional, but you actually can do that in a civil case. And so, go ahead. Now, so now we're talking about procedural law. Right. Procedural law is the uh, request by the, uh, by the Armstrong and King family for a summary judgment. Go ahead and decide the, the case, Judge, just on what's on the record. We don't need to have a trial. And the judge did just that. He decided the case and went against us, went completely against us. So it was a legal loophole, you think? I think so, uh, because you know one of the um, one of the things we hold dear in the United States is we have a right to have a trial, and we absolutely do, at least in criminal cases. This was a civil case; the laws and the procedures are a little bit uh, different, but still, I think it would have been in the interest of nothing else, history, for the judge to go ahead and allow a trial to be conducted to present evidence and to uh, have an opportunity to present documents in open court mm -hmm. uh, as to our claim and then have a ruling or even a, 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 a jury to rule on it. Obviously, if a jury had ruled on it since it was filed in South Texas, we all know that the jury would have gone in favor of, of my family because uh, that area of the country right now is about 85% Hispanic. So. Uh, uh, that's why I guess uh, the uh, our opponents uh, requested a summary judgment because uh, they didn't want to put it in the hands of a jury. They knew exactly what was going to happen. So, what is a counter summary judgment called in law? Is there such a thing? Uh, you answer. Okay. You answer the summary judgment. A rebuttal. Uh, a rebuttal. Okay. And as I learned in law school, a summary judgment is what uh, a way to look at it. it it's a paper trial. The judge makes the decision based on the paper, documents, videos, photographs that's been filed of, of record in court and makes his decision on that. It uh, could be false. Well, not a default. Default is when you don't answer. No, the, it could be false. What oh, it could right be false. Yeah. It could be false, absolutely. Uh, and there's no way to verify that. Uh, unless you have a full-blown jury uh, where you're required to present proof of what's being submitted, the documentation and, and all this, but um, 
unfortunately, we didn't get to that um, level. So this was what year when your family initiated this? We, we started this legal uh -huh. procedure. Back in uh, 1986, and we got poured out in about almost 1990. It was almost 1990 when we got poured out, as they say. Uh, but uh, something did come of it. Uh, my mother wrote her book. Other books were written about the Bayi family, uh, our family, and the descendants uh, became aware of who they are, who their ancestors are, so they can say that uh, that uh, they know who they are, they know who their ancestors, and when people tell them, go back to your country, this is my country, you know? I'm not going back anywhere. This is where I came from. And so, uh, I think this is where um, the saying goes that uh, I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Mm -hmm. Because my family was here uh, generations, generations before this was even part of uh, the United States. So it was a question of who's got more money in a yeah, large part. Yes, a large part has to do that. Uh, it's interesting to note that the, the judge who ruled on it happens to be Republican. It's interesting to note that uh, the judges on the Supreme Court of the state of Texas, all of them, each and every one, a Republican. Republican. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to note that the Court of Appeals uh, is all Republicans, and I'm not saying necessarily they're, they're uh, biased because they happen to be Republican, but uh, you can take that for what uh, you believe yourself. In terms of executive laws, what could the President of the United States, for example, could have done in favor of your family if it would have reached to the executive level? Is that possible? Rarely does that happen because this is the judicial branch and the, uh, and, uh, the people that are against us would have, would have hollered separation of, of the various groups of government. You know, there's three branches of government. And they would say that the executive branch has no business deciding cases um, the judiciary. In, in the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Unless, however, it comes to treaties, uh, which, again, the presidents of Mexico and the president of the United States at that time uh, agreed to, and had the president at that time wanted to get involved, he could have filed is what is called a amincus brief. Amincus comes from the Latin word amigo. Uh, that you're a friend of the court and you're filing an amicus brief uh, to weigh in, which uh, uh, presidents do all the time, uh, s just uh, to act as instructions for the court and what is their opinion uh, on how this uh, case should come out. And, uh, and uh, many times this will actually do the trick. Uh, on, on cases is when you when the executive branch, for example, files that amicus brief. Mm -hmm. A question Friend of the court. Mr. Chavana. Now, is is it true that Congress did not ratify the Treaty of Guadalupe, Hidalgo, correct? That is true. Okay. So if Congress did not ratify the Treaty of Guadalupe, Hidalgo, could, if it would have reached up to the Congress, your case, couldn't the Congress then say, well, it was never ratified? So therefore, it has no standing. That's, that would presumably be the argument. And I guess that's why um, we haven't uh, gone to the federal level mm -hmm. uh, to seek relief in federal court. Mm -hmm. And we were hoping to get relief here in state court. Um, but it didn't go that way. And there have been, our case was not the only case. There have been other cases uh, filed uh, uh, through the years. and. Um, there was one interested in Nicolás Bailly back in 1942 where the Supreme Court of the state of Texas actually said, we do declare that at least one time your family did own and have the rights granted to it by the Spanish land grants, but we're not saying that's the case today. You see? It was the Another, land, but not now. Right. In other words, will give you that, but prove that you should have the land today. So it kind of left uh, open the possibility of filing a lawsuit, which again, 
we were getting prepared to do when the declaratory judgment was filed. So there's a concept in law called stare decisis. If everything would have played in the favor of your family, what stare decisis do you think your family would have? I think one of the best stare decisis that we could have possibly brought forth is the case of the Native Americans. And they've had excellent results in claiming lands that Congress did not ratify, but there was presidential treaties signed by the chief of a particular tribe and the president at that time. Andrew Jackson signed many treaties with Indians, which were promptly ignored. We all know what has happened to many of the Native Americans, although some have done pretty good at the casinos. But many of those treaties between Native Americans were just trampled upon. And their land was dispossessed, and there was mass annihilation of the Native Americans. But here of late, I'd say for the past 25 years, they've had excellent results. Not all, but they've had excellent results in bringing forth their claim to their land here in the United States to the tribal lands that they once had. So in the area of South Texas, what land rights movements are going on right now among family members? There are many who are claiming different and various claims. Falcón is one. There's the dam near Rio Grande City. The Falcón family is one, for example, that had many thousand acres. But again, we get stymied. We get put back by factors such as, again, adverse possession. You know, that keeps hitting us in the face every time. How are we going to get around adverse possession? And the political facts that exist right now, you know. The partisan politics. Exactly. That stymie our efforts at every move to make claims. So there's the Falcón family land rights campaign, and what other ones? I'm not certain. There are others that I've heard of that I'm not individually involved with, as I was with my family's matter, La Barreta. That was a little bit north of the Rio Grande River. But there are many, many movements afoot right now, and they're looking for ways to how they can address the issue and get around the issue of partisan politics and adverse possession. How do you get around this? Pretty tough. So within the study of Mexican-American studies, where do you see the history of your family's land rights struggle? Where do you think it fits in? Historical, anthropological? Where do you see it fits in? Politics? Yes, particularly politics. I think, if nothing else, we as a family, and we have a BAE organization that I'm a member of, and we meet two or three times a year. And I remind them that, if nothing else, we have obtained something that is invaluable. We have obtained knowledge of who we are, where we came from, who our ancestors were, how we were dispossessed of our lands, and that the younger generation should never forget this. Though we may never see these lands again, I think that the main thing that we can inculcate to our younger generation is that they should be vigilant about their rights. And I write in the foreword there of my mother's book that, if nothing else, the younger generation should be attuned to their rights and not allow themselves to be bulldozed over. Because we, as a group of people, do have the rights to our property, and to our education, and to all the facets of life that anyone else has. And if nothing else, I think that that was probably, in some ways, more important than the property. More important. That these young people have become aware, and that my mother, my 
grandfather, my great grandfather, has given me, uh, given us uh, this gift uh, of, of who we are, where we came from. And we can uh, say, don't tell me, go home. I am home. Don't give me that. And I've been here before you got here. I have some time, if you have time, sure. to uh, entertain some questions from the students, our <coughs> viewers. Um, does anybody questions? have a question? I have a question. question. The, uh, the judge that, that, that you were speaking of earlier, what was his name? I think it was Judge Morrison uh, out of uh, Austin. That's where he was sitting. And were any of them, well, I mean, were, was it known or not known if any of them were related to your opponents by chance? We don't know that. We don't think so. But it's interesting to note that uh, as on the Armstrong side, uh, they, uh, the part that, that part of the part, part of the lands that we were claiming were um, awarded to the Catholic Church. So we were also fighting, in fact, the Catholic Church, which is a little diff difficult in South Texas when you're fighting against the very church that you grew up in, that you were baptized in, perhaps married in, into, uh, and so there was that added conflict that we we're also fighting against the Catholic Church. But hey, this is business. This is <laughs> that comes first. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I, I hope. I think I lost my thought. Um, my question, I think, was concerning the um, the various. I guess the various parts of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Yes, Guadalupe Hidalgo. Okay, are any of the other facets of the treaty uh, enforced? The main part uh, is that uh, when uh, this part uh, that used to be Mexico became the United States, the whole idea was that the persons who lived here, i.e. Mexicans, because it was Mexico, their rights as to property, their rights as to education, their rights as to file, the right to file uh, cases in, in courts, that all the rights everyone else had that were here, that these rights would also be uh, acknowledged and uh, that these rights would, uh, would also apply to these people. What I'm asking is, and I guess I need to be a little bit more specific, it didn't have anything to do with establishing a border? A what? A border. The border was already established uh, after the war. Uh, basically, there was an argument about that. Uh, at first, uh, the Mexican government proposed that we'll go ahead and cede the land to you, but we're going to request that the border between the United States and Mexico be the Nueces River, uh, which uh, runs through my hometown, Corpus Christi, which would have given Mexico a huge more chunk of land that would have been from the Rio Grande to the Nueces River, a huge chunk of land. And they went round and round and round and they finally said, no, uh, we want it to be the Rio Grande. So that's the river that... And that's not part of the, um, the, the treaty document? That's in a separate document? Separate document. Okay, so are, in, are there any parts of the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that were established that have been continuously enforced? Far as I'm concerned, none. Because all the rights were trampled upon. Now, I was trying to see if there was a case precedent. <laughs> Have you know, a law first mentioned or something. Well, okay. Uh, like to give you the example. Um, if the if the rancher next to you comes to you and tells you your signature is going to be on this deed where you're selling me your land or your brains. What effect does the Treaty of Guadalupe have? Because they or had any treaty. or any treaty, uh, so it was a treaty in in, in in paper, but it was never really enforced, um, and that is why the King Ranch uh, became huge. Right now, it's the second largest ranch in the world, and uh, and that's how 